Good morning once again, everyone. So good to be here with you. We are going to be in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 21. And we're going to be looking at some very important things here today. And um, at first, it looks like as we bleed through 2 Samuel 21 and into chapter 22, it looks like we're going to be encountering some pretty disjointed things. But I think under God, we're going to see how they cohere together. We were discussing that in the uh, morning Sunday school. In God is diversity and unity, three in one. And we're going to look at some distinct things in the scriptures that will all be uh, cohering together nicely, I think, for our benefit, for our learning. But just as a quick aid to the memory, remember last week, uh, last week, what happened? In this, at this time in Israel's history, with King David reigning and ruling over God's covenant people, there was disaster. Three years of famine. David inquired of the Lord, Why the famine, Lord? God re replied, It's because of the previous king, Saul. He broke covenant. He led, he led armed forces into the territory of the Gibeonites, and he slaughtered those people. And he broke the covenant that Israel made with those people 400 years earlier. And we learned that when you make a promise, you've got to keep your promise. And just because time has passed does not um, remove the obligation from you. And I talked specifically about home, fa home and family marriage covenant relationship. And how under attack it is in our age. Nevertheless, people, especially Christian people who make promises to each other, in the sight of God and others, they are obligated to hold that together and to be faithful to their words. And we saw what happens to covenant breakers. Remember what happened there. Seven of them hung on a hill before the Lord. Ghastly scene. And only after atonement was made for the covenant being broken would God heal the land and hear prayer. We said, wow, thank you, Lord, for that powerful reminder of Jesus, what he did for us. Jesus Christ faithful, merciful, beautiful, sinless covenant keeper went to the top of Golgotha and was crucified and slain there. Treated like a covenant breaker, but he was a covenant keeper. He did that so that he could pay for your sin debt and mine. And we said, Lord, thank you for that powerful reminder. Well, today it's a little bit lighter. Ar aren't you happy? We're not going to be too ghastly here today. We have good things to talk about. And I'm not going to ask you to turn here, but it, you can later. In Mark, the 12th chapter, a man came running to Jesus. And he asked Jesus, what is the first and great commandment? Which is the most important of all the commandments? Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, this is the great one right here. You shall, what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I'm thinking today about loving God with our strength, Loving God with your mind, loving God with your heart. Strength, mind, heart. And with that as our chronology, that's going to be our backbone for today's message. Loving God with strength, mind, heart. With that in mind, let's now go to 2 Samuel chapter 21. And let's put in at verse 15. Okay, 2 Samuel 21, verse 15. It says here, when the Philistines were at war war again with Israel, David and his servants went with him, with him, went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then Ishbi Benob, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeriah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, you shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. You get the force of what's happening here? This is a little bit sad, isn't it? Not too long ago, David was a young, strapping, powerful, brave, capable warrior. He took Goliath down fearlessly. The text says in 1 Samuel 17, David ran at the giant. Remember, we, I preached a message on that. We had a visual here. Remember how tall Goliath would have been? And David ran at that giant. 
fearless, strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He took the giant down. He, David, pr prior to that, he killed a lion. He killed a bear. He took a lion by the beard and killed that animal. Powerful young man. But here, in this account, we're reading, David is aging. And now, in battle, he grew faint. And it's a kind of a sad but yet necessary reminder of our human finitude. It's a little reminder that the best of men are what? Men at best. <laughs> I know in my own body I'm not what I used to be. I can't lift the weights I used to be able to lift. I don't move as fast as I once could. Uh, any of us in this room that are trying to play softball? <laughs> I think we have the oldest team in that league, right? I mean <laughs> And you go home and you put the hot water bottle on and, you know, and, and all the rest of it. But the best of men are men at best. And it's a little reminder that there are no strong people, really, physically. We want to say that uh, Samson was strong. You know, don't you think that way? S Judge Samson, boy, he was strong. Not really. You know who is strong? God. God is strong. Samson's strength was derivative. He was a passive recipient of that strength. And don't, aren't you reminded that everything you have was granted, like 1 Corinthians 4 says? You know, Paul asks rhetorically, saints, what do you have that you weren't granted? And you can't think of a single thing, can you? Whatever strength you have, it was derivative. Whatever brilliance, wisdom, knowledge, it was all granted by God. Whatever blessings you have, God has given them to you. And friends, our strength is derivative, and it's limited, and really, for now, it's sort of on loan, isn't it? We all get older, and physical strength starts to wane, and I think the, the message here is, what are you doing with your strength while you have it? I can see the hourglass turning in my own life. The sand is falling out of there, and my strength isn't what it used to be, and what am I doing with the strength I have right now? Because the day will come when I won't have a whole lot of physical strength with which to love the Lord anymore. What are we doing? There's a little something called the judgment seat of Christ. The New Testament talks about it. And this is a review of the Christian's faithfulness. It does not determine salvation, but it will determine rewards in heaven. Responsibility, recognition, rewards. It's all based on how faithful you were to Jesus as you walked through this life. The judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10. We will all give an account. It's a little sobering reminder. Downtime is good. Leisure is good. Entertainment is good. But you know and I know there's a line that gets crossed sometimes where we get into just plain old time wasting and we're not really making good use of our time. Resources, what are you doing with the strength that God has given you? What am I doing? You understand that pastor's not, he's not uh, bludgeoning you from the pulpit. Pastor's speaking to all of us from God's word. I'm included too. See? A little reminder. Are we loving God with all our strength? That's the question. Well, let's move ahead here, and um, let's look at verse 18. Verse 18. Now it happened afterward that there wa was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. That's kind of a gross name for a place, Gob. <laughs> I didn't name it. There was a battle with the Philistines at Gob, then Sibachai, the, the Hushathite, killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. Again, there was war at Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, Elhanan the son of jer Oregim, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the sh shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again, there was war at Gath. There was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, John, uh, Jonathan, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, killed him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Okay, we have a little account here of some warfare and some giants being destroyed by the Israelites. And here we're going to run into a little problem, and we're going to ask whether or not we are loving God with all our minds. Let's see if I can make this work, because I have some pictures here that might be helpful to us. OK. 
Okay, is this working? Can everybody see that? It's like going to the doctor and getting your eyes tested. What's this letter here? <laughs> Who killed Goliath after all? The, our text here in uh, verse 19, well, verse 18. Let's go back to verse 18. Let's back up now to verse 18. Sibachai killed, he's the Hushethite, he killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. Sibachai did the job. Okay. If you read 1 Chronicles chapter 20, you got a contradiction. Three, actually, three contradictions you're going to see here. First of all, it says that the battle here took place in, at a, in a place called Gob, the gross place, Gob. According to 1 Chronicles, uh, this happened at a place called Gezer. Now, which one is it? Where did this happen? Well, you're going to find out that this is not really a contradiction at all. Most Bible scholars would say that Gezer and Gob are the exact same place. They just have different names. In fact, if you had a friend who said to you, I'm going to take my vacation this year in the Big Apple. I'm flying down to the U.S. I'm going to the Big Apple for a week. Wh where are they going? Which city? They're going to New York. You don't say, and th you know, they get back, oh, I had a wonderful time in New York. You don't say, what's wrong with you? I thought you were one of the Big Apple. You change your mind? <laughs> well, you went to New York. Some people choose to go to Sin City. Where's that? Las Vegas, Sin City. Maybe you choose to go somewhere closer to home. I think I'll drive out to the automobile city. Where's that? Steinbeck, where the girls are very, very pretty in Steinbeck. <laughs> I got me one. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Winnipeg has the name too. What are we called? Murder Cow. Everybody knows. Not a, you know, well, no, murder capital. So I think Geezer and Gob are really the same place. They, this is not a problem here. Oh, but who was killed? According to Second uh, Samuel 21, the giant's uh, name is Saf. But if you go to First Chronicles 20, his name is Sippai. Uh-oh, who was killed there? Who did the Hushethite actually kill? Was it... Uh, was it Saf or was it Sippai? And again, if you know some Hebrew, you realize it's the same name. It's the difference between Larry and Lawrence. Same guy, isn't it? You know, when you, when you run into little contradictions like this, I hope you're not um, over-troubled. I hope you don't think, oh, that's it, I'm done being a Christian. I found a problem with the Bible. You don't think like that, right? Sometimes... You're gonna, this is going to happen if you're a diligent student of the scriptures. You're going to come across a contradiction, an apparent contradiction, and you may not get to the bottom of this for years. You know what you do with that contradiction? First thing you do, you say, Lord, will you show me how this works? And the God who wrote the Bible will show you in his good time. And until he shows you, can I recommend you do this? Put it to the back of your mind. Put it on a shelf. And keep studying your Bible, keep reading and discovering wonderful things, and when the time is right, you're going to read something that makes, makes reconciliation. You're going to understand how this works. Uh, I read a story one time about this uh, preacher was uh, on, uh, riding a train, I think it was the 1800s, and he was enjoying a fish dinner on the train. And he had some, skept some skeptic scoffer sitting in front of him, facing him, and uh, he asked him, you trust that Bible? And he said, absolutely, I do. Well, don't you, don't you see difficulties in the Bible? He said, yes, I do. He says, well, what do you do with those things? He says, I'll, I'll tell you what I do. I do the same thing I'm doing with this fish. I come across a bone and I set it aside. He said, only a fool would, would toss out this delicious fish dinner because there's a few bones in it. I set them to the side of the plate and I enjoy this delicious dinner I have. I think that's good advice when you're reading the Bible and you come across a difficulty. Just set it aside and trust God that he'll explain it to you. So here, you know, we have an apparent, two apparent contradictions. Who was killed? Same guy, a variation of his name, no problem. Where did it happen? Same place. Places have little nicknames, you know, no, no worries. But we do have a bigger contradiction, apparent contradiction, and this concerns Goliath. Uh, it says here in verse 19 that a man named 
Elhanan, the son of Jeroragim, the Bethlehemite, he killed the brother of Goliath. Now, have you noticed in your New King James Bible, the brother of is in italics? Do you see that? There's the words are slanted. If you have a more literal translation, I think um, Danny has a more literal. What's yours, Danny? You have a new revised or something? New American Standard. It's translated in literal wooden fashion, and it actually says that El Elhanan, the son of Jeroragim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath. He just killed Goliath there. Now, do you see a problem here? What's the problem? Who killed Goliath? David killed Goliath, not this man. Some people say, well, maybe, maybe Elhanan is just another name for David. Maybe David has a nickname. And ancient Jewish uh, expositors suggested that one. But we run into another problem, don't we? David killed Goliath in the Valley of Elah. He didn't kill him at Gob or Gezer. This is not talking about David. And um, I want to show you something here. Now, this is going to get technical, but we want to love the Lord with all our what? Mind. Love the Lord with all your strength. Love the Lord with all your mind. Now we're going to engage the faculty of reason. And I'm not going to do this every time I get to the pulpit, but I'm going to show you something about in-depth Bible study that can be very, very helpful to us. Well, here is uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21. The Bethlehemite, uh, he killed... Goliath. And here you see a little two-letter Hebrew word, the Aleph and the Tav, untranslated for you. It just sits there. We don't, we don't bring that into English. But he killed Goliath. In 1 Chronicles 20, we're told that he killed the brother of Goliath. And here is that word showing up again with an extra character. Here's 2 Samuel. There's 1 Chronicles. Same two letters, but now we have a little Yod there makes the difference. We translate this, the brother of Goliath. So what's the obvious answer here? Maybe a scribal error? Maybe the scribe dropped the Yod. And now it's here, untranslated, in 2 Samuel. That's possible. But you know, I'm one of these guys who thinks the Bible is completely infallible, and there are no scribal errors. And if I can, if I can prevent that kind of explanation, I will. But I want to show you something. Uh, this little untranslated word, two letters, shows up again in Judges, the first chapter. Look at Judges 1.16. Now the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the south near Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. With among, there's that little two-letter word that we saw untranslated in 2 Samuel. The word is translated with or among. So here is a possible explanation, and I think it's the right one. That little word may refer to someone with Goliath, that is to say, a family member. Reasonably, it refers to his brother. So the italics there are just not being thrown in to prevent a contradiction. They're being thrown in th based on an interpre interpretive principle here. It's not just to avoid a contradiction. I will point out that Chronicles was written after 2 Samuel, and the author of Chronicles obviously understood the text that way. So we do not have a contradiction in our Bibles. But this is a little um, encouragement to us, okay? Number one, notice that throughout C Jewish and Christian history, there's no attempt by the Jews or the Christians to fiddle with the text to make it agree. Christians aren't doing that. Jews aren't doing that. They just leave the text as it is. Don't you think they would want to amend it to avoid these apparent contradictions? They said, no way, we're going to leave it as it is. It's God's word, but we're going to copy it just right. Secondly, uh, it's a little encouragement not to throw your Bible in the garbage can when you come up against a little difficulty. The Bible says that the entirety of God's word is truth and every one of his righteous judgments endures forever. The whole book is true. 
There are no contradictions. There are no lies. There are no errors. The whole book is 100% true. And so when you come up against a difficulty, it may take you some time to get to the bottom of it, and it may take some in-depth Bible study. It's certainly going to take some prayer. But you're going to you're get your answer. Jesus said, ask, seek, knock, and it'll be granted to you. Didn't he say that? He also said, my sheep hear my voice. If you're a diligent student of the scriptures, just ask the Lord for some help with these things. And he'll give you the help you need. Is that encouraging to you? I hope that's encouraging to all of you. Now, some of you are thinking, boy, that's pretty dry. Wow. So I hope Pastor John doesn't make a habit of that kind of preaching. Hey, I won't, but this is just a little encouragement to open your Bible and study it prayerfully and carefully, okay? Now, let's go to chapter uh, 22 now. And this is going to be more um, personal. This is going to be more practical. Uh, this is going to be more understandable. More low level, but still important, okay? Chapter 22, verse 1. Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will, well, he says, well, just drop down here. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. This little song here that's recorded in 2 Samuel 22 is actually Psalm 18. If you kept reading the Bible, you'd hit the song again in the Psalms. It's Psalm 18. And in Psalm 18, there's a line added right at the beginning. I almost read it. It says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Okay? Now, I want you to think about something here. In these four verses, if we include the first verse, the first line from Psalm 18, David will refer to himself 16 times. Four verses. 16 references to I or my. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my strength, in whom uh, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. 16 self-references in four verses. And a lot of people, they, they don't like modern worship music. One of their problems with modern worship music is, boy, the, the artist sure refers to himself a lot. Whatever problems modern worship music may have, and they, there is some, the fact that the, there's reference to the songwriter cannot by itself be a problem. Because David's going to do this 16 times here, do you see? The point here is that David has a personal relationship with God. I think that's what we're supposed to draw from this. God is a personal living being. God is not an abstraction. God is not an idea that you adopt with your mind. God is a living, personal reality, and the saving benefits of what God and Christ did on the cross are to be experienced, personally, apprehended, enjoyed, personally personally. God is not supposed to just be talked about. You're not just to contemplate God or discuss God or debate certain aspects of God. Mental assent is insufficient. I need to talk like this because in the North American church, there's a whole group of people that think if you just know a lot about God, that's good enough. God is pleased with you if you just read the Bible a lot. Is that true? Is God pleased with people just because they read the Bible? No. There are non-believers that read the Bible. Mental assent is insufficient. And in fact, if you think about it, you could tell, I could tell Joey over here. I always pick on Joey. You're right there, Joey. I could say to Joey, God is so great, Joey. He is all-powerful and he knows everything and on and on and on. Do you think that is sufficient to get me to heaven? Because I'm saying good things about God? insufficient. 
Uh, you can even say, uh, you, you could say good things about God's people. You can say good things about the gospel. Insufficient for salvation. I'll tell you something. This is shocking. Listen to this one. You can even say good things to Jesus himself, declare to him your belief that he is God. You can say to Jesus, I think that you're God. I think that you died for the sins of the world. I think that you are the Holy One of God. And you'll still, you can still go to hell and declare those things. Are, are you getting the force of this? The Bible tells us that in the days of his earthly ministry, Jesus was confronted by this man who was completely demonized. And you know what came out of that man's lips? Words directed at Jesus. I know you, who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Was that sufficient to save that person? No. Absolutely not. You can, God is not impressed when we say good things about him or to him. He already knows those things about himself. Personal salvation is more than that. Much more. Praising God is essential, but what? Insufficient. Personal apprehension of his salvation. Personal relationship with God. And I want to say something. Even though David has such emphasis here on personal relationship with God, there is nothing in his words here that promotes autonomy or self-sufficiency. Are you seeing that? He talks a lot about himself and, and his relation with God, but David doesn't make one move towards promoting or endorsing the idea that he can do anything on his own. In fact, it's just quite the opposite David confessed in these four verses complete and utter dependence on the Lord God. Did you see that? Look at the words he uses, the terms he uses to describe God. Rock, you're my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, you're my strength. That, you know, funny David would say that. He's just been sidelined. No more going to battle, David. You're too weak now. You're too old. You're too feeble. God, David looks to God, well, you're my strength. My physical strength is waning, but you're my strength, God. Sort of like Paul said, when I'm weak, I'm strong. More dependence on the Lord. He says, God, you're my shield. I can't even protect myself, but you're my shield. You're my stronghold. You're my refuge. You're my Savior. God, my Savior. Major, major theme. It goes all the way through the whole Bible. God, our Savior. And what does God save people from, anyhow? This is shocking. You know what God saves people from? Himself. You come before him, and you're not prepared, he'll consign you to the lake of fire forever. Why does he do that? Because he's mean? No, because he's holy. With him, wicked cannot dwell. And he doesn't love your sin, but he sure loves you. But he says that sin needs to be taken care of. We come into this world double disasters. We come into the world with sin natures that cannot be admitted into heaven. It would destroy heaven. We come into this world with a sin debt, guilty in Adam. And we just keep on adding to our sin debt. God says you're guilty by nature, and you're guilty by sins you've committed, and you're not fit for heaven. I can't let you in. I can't have fellowship with you the way you are. In fact, in one sense, God hates you the way you are. And in another sense, he loves you so much, he's willing to do something about it. He loves you so much, he can change you and make you something fit for heaven and a person who can fellowship with, him, with himself. Isn't that amazing? What does he save people from? The just punishment for the, their sins. What does that look like? In this life, I'm seeing it more and more, by the way, friends. The just punishment for your sins in this life? Fruitless, aimless, hopeless, meandering through life without a plan or a purpose. Just from one thrill-seeking experience, pleasure-seeking experience to the next. And nothing gives any lasting real joy or peace. That's the just punishment for your sin. And in the life to come, eternal conscious torment in the lake of fire. 
That's the just punishment for our sins. But see, God has come into the world in the person of his son Jesus to do what? To save people from their sins. John, the third chapter, records beautiful words from the lips of Jesus. The Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That was the ministry of Jesus. He didn't come into the world to, to be hard on people, to condemn people, but to rescue people. He came on a great rescue mission. That's Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God. Who does he save? Who receives the saving benefits of what Jesus did on the cross? Look ahead, please, at verse 28. 2 Samuel 22, verse 28. And this is amazing. Do you have it? David, moved by the Holy Spirit to write this psalm, says this, to and of God. You will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. It's Proverbs 16. Though hand joined in hand, they will not go unpunished. And pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Do you come to God in some kind of uh, autonomous, self-sufficient attitude, as though you don't have sins that need to be forgiven? And God will judge you. But you come to him as someone who acknowledges their great need, their sin debt, you acknowledge that you have offended this holy God and you need his forgiveness and cleansing, salvation, restoration. And you know what he'll do? He'll save you on the spot. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, said Jesus. They will be comforted. God can save those who really are mourning for their sin. See how personal this is? This is not easy. I don't know anybody who has come to the Lord for real, honestly, received Christ as the one who paid their sin debt in full on that cross, and they did it without tears. It's, it's, it comes. You realize how needy you really were and how good he really was. Blessed are those who mourn, who mourn for their sins. They'll be comforted. I think about Isaiah the prophet. Remember Isaiah the prophet? He came into the presence of a holy God and he said, I'm, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, I'm filthy. So that's mourning for sin. That's being troubled over your sin. Jesus, we are told, w was sitting at dinner one, one day uh, in a Pharisee's home and a woman laden with sin came and she fell at his feet and she wept and she washed his feet with her tears and she dried his feet with her hair. And she was a sinner. And was she mourning for sin? Yes. And Jesus tells a story in Luke's gospel about a publican, a tax collector, despised by faithful Israelites. He went up to the temple to pray. Jesus said this man was so troubled, so heartbroken, so devastated by his sins, he beat his breast and he couldn't even look up to heaven. He couldn't look up to God. He just looked at the ground. And he can only manage one thing out of his mouth. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know what Jesus said about these, about these things? He said, the mourners will be comforted and the filthy will be cleansed. And he said, the sinners will be forgiven and the repentant will be justified. But you see, you don't do this in an uncaring, unfeeling fashion. Salvation doesn't come to people who robotically recite some kind of prayer. This is people who have recognized their great need, recognized their sinfulness, and they recognize that their only provision in these things is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's it. Personal love-trust relationship with God. Do we love God with all our strength, with all our mind as we approach the Scriptures? with all our hearts as we think about Jesus, Son of God, beautiful Savior, Lamb of God, hangs on a cross for six hours for your sins and mine. Do you love him? He loved you first. He is so worthy of all our love. Repentant sinners justified to the praise of his glory forever and ever. May that be so.
So I'm stopped right there. A word of prayer. Let's ask God to seal this into our hearts. <clears throat> Almighty God, we approach you now on the merits of Jesus Christ, your own beloved one. Lord God, we marvel that you love sinners enough to come into the world in the person of your Son to take upon yourself in his person, in his body, our entire sin debt, the sin debt of the whole world. Incredible mystery of mysteries. Lord God, even when we're saved and sealed, even when we're blood-bought, members of the church, the body and bride of Christ, we slip into sin. And you are forgiving and kind, and you restore, and you show patience with us, slow to learn, Thank you, God, for your promises to never leave us or forsake us. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you will empower and encourage your people here today. Give them the joy of the Lord and may it never be taken from them. Empower your people to be faithful ambassadors carrying the life-saving gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. May our witness be exceeding powerful and effective. May it be like light that slashes into darkness and shows the way to life everlasting. To the praise of God's glory and for the good of God's people, and it's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen and amen. Praise God Almighty. What a Savior. Amen.